Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your patience as we get started here and welcome to the Epilepsy Foundation of Connecticut webinar. This is a three part series on transition, which has been generously provided by the Yukon uh, Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. So we're really excited um, for this opportunity to present uh, these great professionals in the field on this uh, very important topic. My name is Monica Anzalone, and I will be moderating today's webinar. And for the purpose of sound quality, everyone will be put in listen-only mode. However, we do welcome you to use the chat icon on the bottom of your screen to type your questions. And the questions will be answered at the end of the webinar today. So our first webinar is on will be an overview of transition and we'll discuss how families can make either their son or their daughters transition from school to adult life seamless. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Linda Ramler. Dr. Ramler is the Community Education Director at the Yukon Center for Excellence on in Developmental Disabilities. She has over 40 years of experience in disabilities. Currently, she coordinates many projects for the youth set, including Healthy Communities in Collaboration with Special Olympics Connecticut, the Think College Strategic Planning Initiative, and a customized employment project in collaboration with the Connecticut Council on Developmental Disabilities and Disability Rights Connecticut, and more. She has been involved with inclusive education, transitioning from school to adulthood, and competitive integrated employment of individuals previously thought incapable of working. Clearly, we have a very experienced speaker today, and I will uh, uh, send this on over to Dr. Ramwood for us to get started. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and welcome, everybody. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, the official title of this webinar is Seamless Transitioning for Students with Epilepsy who have 504 plans or IEPs. What do families need to know? But if you have a child who does not have a 504 plan or an IEP currently or has already aged out of school, I think you'll find some of the information that I'm going to cover helpful anyway. Um, because seamlessness is something that we ideally would have for every single individual who leaves the school and enters adulthood, whether they're going on to post-secondary education or going directly into the world of work. Um, but it's not always possible. What we want to do is come as close as we possibly can. And that means that families really have to take a lot into consideration and not trust the system. So we don't have a crystal ball about our future, but we can see some things. And of course, we want everybody to have success. And of course, this is not going down the way it's supposed to for the next page. So let me, there you go. Okay, so just a little bit about the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. We are federally funded. We're part of um, a triad of sister agencies with the Disability Resource, um, I'm sorry, Disability Rights Connecticut, as well as the Developmental Disabilities Council of Connecticut. Um, the USED specifically is involved with interdisciplinary training, research, dissemination, and community service, which is primarily what I do. And all of us are, are to have an impact on people with developmental disabilities in terms of the quality of their life. So as Monica said, this webinar is the first in a three-part series. The second one will be next Friday. Um, it should say from one to two, not from one to four. Um, Developing self-determination in youth with epilepsy. That will be presented by Dr. Nicholas Gelbar, who is our uh, research director here. And the following Friday on June 29th, also from just one to two, will be issues in transition from pediatric to adult health care for youth with epilepsy. Um, and I think you'll find both of those uh, good, good answers to some of the questions that may come up today, specifically for young adults or adolescents who have epilepsy. Just want to let you know that the PowerPoints will all be available in PDF format on our web website, which is www.uconusaid.org, along with the taping of the webinar itself. So if we tip Typically, if you were face to face, we might or might not hand out handouts, but they will be available to you after after we're done with this. So today, what we want to address is the big adjustment that happens when grade school days are over, and whether again somebody's moving on to post secondary schooling or the world of work. 
we really want to see everybody doing one or the other. Um, there are often extra steps needed for students with 504 plans or individualized education programs. And what we want to do is provide an overview of what parents can do um, of those adolescents and young adults to facilitate as seamless a transition as possible. So when I talk about transition, and you hear it from schools, what we're really talking about by way of secondary transition are thoughtfully planned movement from school to post-school activities that include post-secondary education, vocational education, integrated employment, including supported employment, and I would add something else called customized employment, continuing in adult education, adult services, independent living, or community participation. When the federal government added the years 18 to 21 to the Federal Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, they were not thinking that people who were still eligible for those services would continue with an academic program. What they were thinking is that those years would really be used as preparatory for adults. So we're looking at futures planning, we're looking at how do you prepare somebody or get them into an employment scenario, self-advocacy, independent living, et cetera. So I want to talk a little bit before we even start in about high school completion because oftentimes there's some confusion with families about what that means. If you have a child, regardless of whether or not they have epilepsy, who does not have an IEP and does not have a 504 plan, the way things go is once they've met their academic requirements, that is once they've gotten the approved credits needed for graduation, they have a diploma that's awarded to them. For individuals who only have a 504 plan, Final plan can follow the individual to post secondary education or training programs, our state peer rehabilitation services, or even work as reasonable accommodations. And the academic requirements are met, the diploma is awarded. Having only a 504 plan does not make you eligible for any additional services through the public school system. If you have an IEP and you've met your academic requirements, Requirements. Again, the minimum credits are earned to fulfill the high school diploma requirements, and you have no other IEP goals and objectives, you're awarded your diploma. However, if you have transition goals and objectives that have not been met, the diploma is not awarded until non-academic IEP goals and objectives are met, or your son or daughter ages out. And ages out in Connecticut means that they turn 21 years of age, the end of that school year is when they age out. So if your child is lucky enough to have a birthday in June after the last day of school and they turn 21 on that birthday, they're eligible for another year of schooling. However, if your child turns 21 on June 15th and the last day of school is June 16th, they are not eligible for another year. So that's something to take into account if your child has an idea. Some children with epilepsy have IEPs that have not met academic requirements by ages 18 to 19-ish. So what we still want to do in those remaining years of eligibility up to 21 is to still focus on transition goals and objectives that maximize independent living and employment opportunities until one of two things happen. Either those goals and objectives are met or the student ages out with some sort of turnkey to adult services and supports. During that time period, if your child is still working truly on an actual academic high school diploma, it's not inappropriate to look at additional credits through alternatives. We don't want to have a 20-year-old in school, 17 and 16-year-olds, but there are options like credit recovery, adult education, and so on. Generally speaking, though, if you have an IEP and you're working on your transition goals and objectives, you are only looking at functional use of any kinds of academics and not continued academic instruction to remediate any academic skills issues that you may still have. If you're watching this and your child is not in their teens yet or um, may even be young and newly diagnosed, does it mean that transition planning does not matter? Absolutely not. You should be assigning chores like we assign to typical kids. They should have playmates and play dates, lots of community exposure and inclusion high expectations, you want to encourage dreaming, you want to identify and stay on top of changes in interests, preferences, likes, dislikes, talents, unique skills, etc. You want to have a savings account, a hope chest, or whatever you're doing for their siblings, or whatever you would do if they did not have epilepsy.
RC. You want to be connected to your community, and if you're in doubt about what's age appropriate, ask other kids your child's chronological age. So transition thinking has to start, just like most of us, when we start realizing that we're going to be parents, what are we going to do? What's going to happen when our child goes up? Most of us have dreams and thoughts about what's possible, and we don't want to give that stuff up just because our child gets a diagnosis of whatever. What we do want to do, however, is avoid the cliff. Now, typical kids who are going to the school system have a way of avoiding the cliff naturally, and if they fall off the cliff because they graduated from high school and didn't have any clear plans in place, they're usually able to pick themselves up eventually by their bootstraps and carry on and get back on a target for a decent life. Sometimes with kids who have epilepsy or with any kind of co-occurring disabilities, they're going to need additional support for that to happen. And that's where we want to make sure that families understand that the cliff is IDEA services will occur until your child either meets their IEP goals and objectives and or their academic requirements, as I said before, but there's no mandate for adult services. So your child literally can fall off a cliff and end up being not professional terms, but sitting at a couch being a couch potato, unemployed, all sorts of other negative things if we don't do appropriate planning. So again, we want to avoid that cliff, and I think particularly vulnerable is anybody who may have had a 504 plan or an IEP. Um, and because we, if we don't do the good planning, those services are not necessarily guaranteed for adults. So at the day, end of today's webinar, what we'd like you to do is be able to state unique needs that students with epilepsy with or without any co-occurring diagnoses have that would need to be taken into account before school years end. And as I said, even if school years have ended for you, I want this to be something that you can still use because it's never too late. I want you to be able to identify personal strengths that your young adult or adolescent has to develop and facilitate a quality adult life. I want you to develop personal and community connections for support and have some strategies to do that. To be able to access assistive technologies to facilitate independence. To be able to state the legal opportunities that your son or daughter may be eligible for as a person with epilepsy. Under Section 504 of the Rehab Act of 1973, it should say, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004 and the Workforce Ascendance and Opportunities Act of 2014, which is brand new. We also have the Americans with Disabilities Act and the new ABLE account law, some other things that I'll get into a little bit later. And we want you to be able to identify additional resources to assist you as a family member in the transition journey. So objective one about unique needs. We know that students with epilepsy um, sometimes develop in typical fashion, but sometimes they may need to learn skills that are either differently acquired or unique to them. So some of the things that are documented in the literature is that not all students with epilepsy have age-appropriate social-emotional skills. It may be because of periods of intense seizures because before they became um, under control that they didn't have typical opportunities to interact friends, um, they may have anger management issues post -fictally. so those kinds of age-appropriate social-emotional skills may be um, not at age-appropriate level for somebody who's graduating from high school. They may have self-management issues, and that may involve avoiding triggers, for example, um, going to places where there's flashing lights, loud music, like high school dances, or concerts, and self-having the self-management and the um, kind of the wherewithal to avoid using substances like drugs or alcohol that could have really dangerous medication interactions. Some people with epilepsy need additional time management skills that are necessary to accommodate sleepiness, to avoid additional stress that could be contributing to seizures. Some people have self-esteem or self-confidence issues. Um, for example, sometimes the medication that people are on may cause them to gain weight. Um, weight is unfortunately not something that's valued in our culture. We emphasize slimness and so on. That could affect some people's self-esteem. They may not have self-confidence because every time they try to do something, they may have been set back because of some seizure episodes and so on. And they also may not have age-appropriate independence, either because they haven't been given those chores, those opportunities to explore their communities, et cetera, in the past or because they've been very dependent on their family members for 
for reasons related to your epilepsy. So either way, um, we want to make sure that those unique needs are taken into account. Um, Dr. Schramm will be talking again on June 29th about medical and medication management issues. We know that some people experience um, possible cognitive impact in terms of over overall learning and memory, short or long term issues that can affect all the things I just mentioned. And some people with epilepsy have possible co occurring conditions, for example, an intellectual um, disorder, um, an autism spectrum disorder, physical challenges, and so on. As a result of those, Many people with epilepsy do have 504 plans or IEPs, individualized education programs in school. They may also have a health plan. Um, that does not necessarily entitle you to anything as an adult, but it will be important for transitioning to adult health care. So when you have unique needs, there are things that are more of a challenge to you. You need to know your rights as somebody with a disability that is um, Related to your epilepsy, you need to learn to speak up for yourself and ask questions. As a parent, you need to be sure that you know your child better than anyone else because you're equally important, if not more important, to your child's future than any professional because you're going to be there as long as you can. And we want to make sure that your, your young adult has an option of really self-determining their life and not having their life decided by others. Really quickly, I do want to go over the difference between self-advocacy and self-determination, although again, Nick Elbar will go over that more next week, that self-advocacy is a skill of speaking up for yourself or acting for yourself, deciding what's best for you and taking charge of what you want. It means standing up for your rights as a person. Whereas self-determination is a characteristic of the person that leads them to make choices and decisions based on their own preferences and interests to monitor and regulate their own actions and to be goal-oriented and self-directing. So when we talk about anybody who is growing up, we want them to have some advocacy skills. We want them to self-determine their life as much as they can, even though life sometimes gets in the way. For kids who may have conditions that are secondary to their epilepsy that prevent them from developing these vicarious so they may need to have specific lessons in how to self-advocate and what it means to self-determine. And it may mean as a parent that you need to um, pay particular attention to ensure that those things happen. But having unique needs should not affect quality of life. An important part of today's um, presentation is with good planning and needed supports in place, people with any kind of disability or disabled condition can still lead an enviable life as um, Rod and Ann Turnbull have said about their son. So the second objective of today is to focus on personal strengths. And in this, having a seamless transition means that you and your son or daughter need to, try to start with the end in mind. What vision of a positive future do you have for your son or daughter? And positive future should not be, oh, I would like them to go to college, but because they did die, we don't want to hear the buts. We want to know what your vision is of a positive future. We also know what you want to avoid in the future. You want to avoid chronic hospitalization. You want to avoid loneliness. These are things that all of us as parents want to avoid in the future. So starting with the end in mind is a very important place to start when you're thinking about transition and then looking at personal strengths. Part of starting with the end in mind is realizing that achieving valued life outcomes are possible for everyone. And valued life outcomes are those same types of outcomes we want for any of our loved ones who don't have a disability or a disabling condition, or a condition that could potentially become disabled over time. So one thing is a place of one's own to call home. We want people to have connections with family and friends. We want them to be successful. We want them to have quality free time, making the most of it. We want them to have money to do what they want to do with their lives. We want to make sure that their human rights are upheld. Um, making sure that they have fun on the journey of growing up and that you're worthy of the trip, self-confidence and self-esteem, like I said before. If they're having difficulty making decisions on their own, we want to look at guardianship alternatives and something new that's called supported decision-making, which is something I can't get into today, but it may be something you want to look into on your own. We want to celebrate diversity. So what? If you have epilepsy, you may be different. But you're a human being and you have the same opportunities and same needs for valued life outcomes as anyone else. And the gift of giving back to your community. 
But one of the things we also emphasize in all this is how much more feasible are these if you're employed and earning a living rather than living in poverty. So employment first is something that we're always thinking of regardless of well, the level of functioning of the individual. That's something that we now know with customized employment, supported employment, that can become a reality for everyone. One of the ways of doing this is you raise expectations by having high expectations. It doesn't mean that those expectations are unrealistic, but you want to reach for the stars because if you don't reach the stars, you can settle for the moon, but if you only reach for the moon, you may never get off the ground. And that's been a guideline for me for as long as um, I can remember. So in all of our planning and our transition thinking about kids, regardless of who they are, regardless of how they are, we want to make sure that we have the best possible valued life outcomes as our goal and do what we can to help them meet that. So step one is moving away from what's wrong. Prejudices, overprotectiveness, thinking in terms of mental age, thinking in terms of deficits, weaknesses, and what doesn't work, hoping for a cure. It's not realistic. She or he is too whatever, waiting for someone else to do it. So if we start thinking about what's wrong with our children, we're gonna come up with barriers for them achieving those values like outcomes, which we want to avoid. So to paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, nothing can stop a family and individual with the right mental attitude from achieving their goal. Nothing on earth can help those with the wrong mental attitude. For step one, moving away from what's wrong with your child, what the barriers are, and starting to think in terms of positive things. The second step in doing that is wiping your board clean of deficit thinking. Unfortunately, a lot of our public schools have conveyed the message about your son or daughter will never be able to. They can't. They are, insert your negative adjective there, they're too lazy, to, um, to fill in the blank. Um, those diagnoses may pile up. You must have or have done something to deserve having a child like this is something that many people in some cultures have experienced. Surely a cure is just around the corner. There's definitely things that can help control epilepsy. But having a cure, no, not so much at this particular point in time. And there are people who are going to give you other unhelpful advice about what you should be looking at. Um, what we do have to do is accept the reality of discriminations that are based on race, ethnicity, gender, social class, and other isms. But what I want you to do is take a sheet and write down everything negative you could say about the young person concerning you and everything that you've heard said. And after you've written that down, take that sheet of paper, crumple it up, and throw it away because that's not how you make a transition seamless. So step three is that we have to look at strength-based person-centered planning. Examples of strength-based person-centered planning is inclusion and celebrating differences supporting people, not controlling them, doing with them, walking the journey with them because community is important, making sure that the balance of power belongs with them, and making it okay to learn from your mistakes and having the same kinds of risks within reason as other kids their age have. The traditional deficit model of interactions is that we exclude kids, we ignore, we hide differences, we try to fix them. We focus on controlling and managing what's going on with them. We do things for them if they can't do them for themselves instead of helping them to do them for themselves or with some support. The balance of power in a deficit model belongs with caretakers or caregivers, whichever term you prefer. And we look at these people as them. They must be protected. It's never too late to start thinking in strength-based person-centered terms. So a non-example is somebody perseverates versus a strength-based description is somebody perseveres. They really seem to like or be interested in doing something. It's not a fixation. It's not a perseveration. It's a good thing. Displays attention-seeking behavior. Well, who among us doesn't? But that's wanting to have a relationship with somebody. And that's an appropriate thing. You have to teach how to do it appropriately, but it's an appropriate thing to want to have a relationship. Frequently off task for avoidance. Sometimes people need to take breaks to regroup or they express disinterest independently. That can be a very positive thing, especially if the task is boring, inappropriate, not helpful, etc. Being non-compliant. Perseverance. We want to think in terms of people who have been survivors in life. Um, no self-control. All of those things go into self-advocacy where you're making a statement about what you like and what you don't like. 
being dependent on others is a non-example or that they can't do something. We want to make sure that we know that somebody does best when they're supported in a particular way or they know what he or she likes. We can look at things like tantrums positively as well, where we look at it as somebody's able to change his or her mind, having a shorter attention span. Splinter skills should be looked at in terms of talents, where somebody's really good at something. If you say they're not smart, they're smart in ways that others may not always recognize, and you as family members can see that, whereas sometimes other people can't. So having lots of problems, including but not limited to, we want to look at things as having strengths, including these types of things about survival skills and wanting to have relationships and really being interested in so on. So after this, this webinar, I really also want you to work with your son or daughter to write down what those strengths are that they have, what people admire in them, and what's important to them, what preferences they have, what interests they have, what passions they have. Those are the things that we need to build on if we're going to make transition for seamless success. The third objective is personal and community connections. Remember that I said adult services are not mandated. There is a cliff there. One of the best ways of avoiding that cliff is to develop good, strong, personal and community connections that do not rely on a service system. One of the first things you want to consider is who is in your child's, in your circles of support. So in this diagram, you see three concentric circles with blue being those people who are really, really close to you. The next concentric circle that's green is people who are known to you, acquaintances, people that you might ask for a favor now and then, but you don't really consider them close to you. And in that last circle, the pinkish one, are people that you may run into, you might not even know their name, they may be there because they have to be, and so on. And we divide those circle members into people who are in your family, people who are socially connected to you, and people who are paid staff. Knowing who is in your circle of support is the first step toward developing a circle of support, because what we often find for people with disabilities or disabling conditions like epilepsy, is that that social circle, particularly um, at the inner level, the intimacy level, the close friendship, the BFF level, as it were, is empty. And the next level out of acquaintances and so on, they may have people in the hallway saying hi to them at school and so on, but they don't really have a strong network of support. And there may be people who know them socially who are in the same group activities as them, but have not really gotten to know them as human beings and may not see them in some respects as worthy of including in their activities. We wanna change all of that. Oftentimes with family members, there's a drifting away from family gatherings if you have a child with a disability, but we often see that the paid staff are very, very um, numerous, particularly in that inner circle. There's a lot of people who are involved, neurologists, um, people who are orthopedic, if you have co-occurring conditions, so on and so forth, psychologists, occupational therapists, et cetera. Um, what we want to do is change the balance of that in our circles. And some of the ways to do that are learning how to build personal and community connections. I find this checklist that was developed by John O'Brien, who's been doing things like person-centered strength-based planning for a very long time, um, has 75 actions that you can do with your son or daughter, your son or daughter can do by him or herself. Rather than going through all of them because of the time limits that we have for this webinar, this is the website, and again, it will be on our website as part of the PowerPoint presentation and as well as the recording of this webinar. That's www.inclusion.com forward slash downloads forward slash actions that build community.pdf. And those are things that range from going next door to your neighbor and saying hi to bringing a flower to somebody that you picked on the way to go see them, and you're, again, making yourself known in a positive way to people around you. That's very important, I cannot emphasize that enough, in the absence of public funding for paid staffing. And public funding for paid staffing is going downhill rapidly. And if your child has a more mild form of disability, there may be some exclusions in terms of what's called now an order of selection, because VOA, Workforce Incentives and Opportunities Act and some other changes in the adult service delivery system are requiring that those who have funding focus on people with the most significant disabilities. Building up your personal and community connections is very, very important. 
for you as a family to do. Another way of doing that is from somebody named John McKnight, who has a way of looking at associations that are in your community that may be things that you want to join or volunteer at or connect with in some way, shape, or form that can help lead to a more enviable life for your son or daughter. So for example, I know a young man whose family um, happened to be Catholic and there happened to be a Knights of Columbus um, that was very involved in his area and he not only joined the Knights of Columbus but actually became I don't know the ranking of it, but he's a very active member and I believe has even held an officer's position, even though he has a pretty significant disability in addition to his epilepsy. So those are the kinds of out-of-the-box thinking, thinking as though there is no box, that when you look at what's available in your community and look at the associations that are there, you may be able to think of something that your son or daughter could do based on those preferences, interests, strengths, and so on, that would expand his or her personal community connections as well as your own. The third objective, oops, sorry, what am I doing here? I'm, okay, so the fourth objective, I'm sorry, is assistive technology. There's an app for that. So when we look at there being an app for that, we're including wearable mattress seizure detection devices and alarms, but we're also looking at all sorts of ways of figuring out how to keep track of your time, prompting yourself to do something that you may not have remembered yourself to do, setting a timer so you're not late for an event, keeping track of your medication, keeping track of your medical history, keeping track of all sorts of things that you may need to do. Um, it really is true nowadays that there's an app for that. Um, if portable electronics typically trigger seizures, you may want to consider things like flicker-free monitors monitor glare guards. If you want to set up a browser feature to disable animation and audio in websites that could trigger a seizure. Um, key grids for touch screen options so that you can have things that are set literally for touching and it will set into action another screen that you can then touch something on the grid and it will set off something in action without ever having to look at the grid. If electronics triggers still trigger seizures, what low tech can be used. Many people with epilepsy already wear bracelets or necklaces that say they have epilepsy. I bet you never thought of those as a low tech device, but it is a low tech device. You can have to-do lists that are regular check off to-do lists that are handwritten or that are typed out, have pocket calendars, there could be emergency communication contact information that's carried in a wallet wristwatch alarms that don't have the visual accompanying them. For somebody who is communicating, um, may not be able to use something like Prolo Photo Go because of the visual impact of the screen. There's picture exchange communication systems. There's ways to do automatic dialing and so on and so forth. Again, in the interest of time, I cannot give you a full workshop on assistive technology that's available, both high and low technology, but there are tons of resources. And as a role in transition, what families need to consider is has the individual been assessed for appropriate independence facilitating low and high tech assistive technology when they're in school? That, assist, that assessment does not require an assistive technology expert, so to speak, to come in, but we ought to know what works for your son or daughter and what doesn't work for your son or daughter. Also, while they're still in school, they should learn how to use appropriate assistive technology and have access to it outside of the school setting so we know what they will need as an adult. And I, again, cannot emphasize how important it is, again, if your child is learning to use any kind of technology in school, that that be available across settings to them as well. So for more information, one of the resources that is available to families and individuals and to school systems as well is located at Oak Hill. Um, and the website for that is oakhillct.org forward slash N-E-A-T hyphen center. And that stands for the New England Assistive Technology Center. And it's one of the Oak Hill centers. You can actually go there and try out various devices. You can see a smart home in action and so on. And I strongly recommend that families do that because again, assistive technology can facilitate independence in ways we never thought were possible. So objective five is looking at some of the legal opportunities. Um, one of our sister agencies, as a USAID, 
is Disability Rights Connecticut. It is our protection and advocacy agency in Connecticut. It is privatized now, and they stand for justice, community, and inclusion. And they have their own website, which is www.disrightsct.org. And this is a place to go if you need to learn more about your legal opportunities and your rights, and also if you feel in any way, shape, or form that your legal rights or your child's legal rights are being um, abridged in any way. Um, the third, by the way, um, agency that's connected with the USED which is the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, is the Connecticut Council on Developmental Disabilities. So how do the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and the Individual with Disabilities Education Act differ? Essentially, 504 was, has been around since 1973. The IDEA has been around since 1975 and was last amended in 2004. The ADA came into play in 1990. Um, and its 25th anniversary was three years ago. So the purposes of all of these are to basically prevent discrimination, but there are many more things in the IDEA where there's funding available, birth to acceptance of high school diploma or age 21, as I talked about before. IDEA only is available through the school and there's special due process requirements. For 504 and the ADA, um, there's not strict regulations for those. There's procedural regulations, but you would have to go through Disability Rights Connecticut, and there's a whole bunch of steps that you might have to take. There's not a specific due process handbook as there is for public school programs. Um, the population, though, is it applies to all federally funded programs and private programs with the ADA as well. Both ADA and 504 are lifetime. Um, they apply from the moment of diagnosis or current all the way through the end of life. There is no funding again, um, and the purpose is to, to prevent discrimination, but not to do some of the things that schools do, which is direct assessment, planning, educational provision, services. So again, once you're no longer eligible for the IDA, you can fall off the cliff, although you can bring that 504 plan with you, as long as you know how to advocate for the provisions in it. So the ADA guarantees equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities in things like public accommodations, employment, transportation, state and local government services, and telecommunications. Um, and 504 is no other otherwise qualified individual with a disability shall solely by reason of his or her disability be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal finance assistance. Again, though, there is no specific way that families can say this is being violated without getting a lawyer and without going through a very cumbersome process of writing letters and so on and so forth. Um, the IDA, again, has very specific due process opportunities for parents, and they require that if the disability adversely affects the child's education performance, and the purpose of education is to enable that child to develop skills toward independence and meaningful community involvement as an adult, then you have what's called an individualized education program in place. Is your child eligible for transition services or protections under any of those laws? The short answer is it depends. They have to meet eligibility criteria, but according to whom? So somebody could have epilepsy but not have an impact on their education, in which case, going back to what I said earlier, they may meet the academic criteria for high school diploma. They age out. You're done with that, they're done with school. All they have left by way of rights, special rights, would be if they're eligible under 504 or the ADA. Due process is only available under the IDEA. Administrative relief if the rights are violated under any act, but again, it's simply usually egregious violations will only result in, or the only ones that will result in compensatory damages. So only the IDEA provides for secondary transition services, which is very important. That does not mean if your child's on a 504 plan that they need to all of a sudden get on an IEP, but it does mean that you need to pay particular attention to what is in that 504 plan and be thinking about as an adult, are there some additional reasonable accommodations that your child may need as an adult in order to survive in the world of work and other aspects of the world as well. There are two new laws, again, that I don't have um, time to go into in more detail, but they're things that are very important. 
One is the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which is essentially a federal employment first for everyone act. And it has changed some of the structures of, for example, our state group of rehabilitation services. So they are now involved in public schooling at an earlier time. And they are really, really looking toward employment for everyone. Employment is very easy to get under two conditions. I shouldn't say very easy because our economy doesn't make it very easy, but it's a lot easier to find an appropriate job that you will sustain over time if it's matched to your personal interest rates, et cetera, or if you're specifically trained in one of the areas where we know there are going to be future openings. And so the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act creates within our Department of Labor and our American Job Centers and our Bureau of Rehabilitation Services greater opportunities for everyone regardless of their condition regardless of any co-occurring conditions, to be able to actually get a job, stay in a job. There's also an ABLE Act, which is relatively recent. It's called Achieving a Better Life Experience Account that allows families under some conditions to set aside an account for their son or daughter that will not affect any public benefits that they're getting, but could be used for things in their future. So I encourage everybody to look at http colon forward slash forward slash able nrc which is stands for the national resource center dot org and learn more about whether your son or daughter is eligible for an able account so objective number six today is about additional resources for families one is something that is um, recent in the past several years and it's got a wealth of information about transition it's sponsored by the State Department of Education and the Community of Practice, which is a community of many, many organizations and agencies involved in transition. It's https colon forward slash forward slash www.cttransition.org. And in that, there is a special place for students. So you may want to sit down with your son or daughter and access all of the resources that are there for students. There's also a special area for families that you can go in and access many resources and other things that may expand on some of the things that I've mentioned today. And there's also an area for professionals. And sometimes it's helpful to have some of the professionals who may be working with your son or daughter to access this website so they understand the importance of transitioning because of the unique needs that your son or daughter may have as a person who has epilepsy. Um, there are some practice groups that people can join. Your transition bill of rights is in there, as well as guideposts for success. And there's a transition timeline, which starts earlier than the 18 to 21 years. It actually goes through all of the things that families should be looking to do with their son or daughter, or their son or daughter can be doing independently, that will help prepare them best for seamless transition. Another resource that's been Available is through Ability Beyond, which is a private nonprofit um, provider agency in Connecticut that is licensed by our Connecticut Department of Developmental Services, but that also provides services to people with a host of other disabilities. And on their website, they have a resource center specific for transition resources, which has eight mini courses for anyone to sign up. It's free to the public. And if you go on the website that's listed here, abilitybeyond.org forward slash resource hyphen center forward slash transition hyphen resources forward slash, you can sign up and take any of those lessons that are meaningful to you, including starting at the very beginning about roles of IEPs, looking at employment first, meaningful daily life opportunities, college post-secondary education, more on social connections and relationships, healthy living, legal issues, and advocacy, as well as finances and eligibility requirements. So these are things that as the family member, you can literally go on, take advantage, and you'll actually see that some of the resources that are there are similar to some of the things that I shared with you already. So what are other things that you should be thinking about today? Transitions in the future, the plan, 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 more planning. You can't go down the shoulda, woulda, coulda road about things I wish I'd known this before. Like I said early on, it's never too late to start and you need to start as soon as you're aware of some of these things. 
as family members, we have to refocus our own roles. And maybe it means that we're giving up on some of the things like improving reading skills, improving math skills, in order that we look at skills that are more functional and relevant to adulthood. We want to think positive futures and dare to dream. Remember that expression, reach for the stars, but settle for the moon. But if you reach for the moon, you may never get off the ground. We want to make sure that we have that vision of valued outcomes for everyone, no matter what. We recognize that getting the support one needs to live a meaningful life is different from being in a program. It's one of the reasons that developing those social connections is so important because there are no programs specific to adults with disabilities. You may or may not be eligible for services from our state department of rehabilitation services. You may or may not be eligible for services from our Department of Developmental Services. You may or may not be eligible for many of the other resources that are available unless you're living a life of poverty, which we really don't want anyone to be living. We want people to have access to all of those valued life outcomes and we know that they're more possible if you have a decent income because you're working and because you're not on some of those social entitlement programs. But that means maximizing empowerment yours and your child and learning about the rights that you have and how, for example, having a job does not mean cutting back on your social security and ineligible for health care benefits. So you're going to need to learn more about those things as well. And we also want to maximize natural supports because in the absence of mandated adult services, we still want our sons and daughters, regardless of where they are, to have opportunities to have friends, meaningful connections to their communities, home of their own, place of their own to call home, success, and so forth. So hopefully um, today, as a result of what we've just covered, you're now able to state some of the unique needs that students with epilepsy that with or without co-occurring diagnoses have that need to be taken into account before school years end. And again, if school years have already ended for your son or daughter, you can still go back to the drawing board and start all over with some of these strategies. Hopefully you are now able to identify personal strengths in your son or daughter to develop and facilitate a quality adult life. Again, by building on the strengths for social connections, for joining things in the community, for figuring out what kind of employment opportunities you want, knowing where you want to live, and so on. You have some strategies for developing personal and community connections for support. You have access to assistive technology to facilitate and Tenants, or at least know where to go to find out more information about them. You have um, some information about some of the legal opportunities that are available. You do have special rights enforcing them. It may be challenging once you're out of the school system, but it's still possible. And as family members, you have some additional resources to assist you in this transition journey. So at this point, um, I want to know if there's any comments or questions from anyone, and feel free to post those in the chat space here. I've left about 10 minutes for that. Um, and anybody, I don't know if anybody from the Epilepsy Foundation would like to ask any questions, but the way you can contact me is Linda Rambler. Um, I actually don't like to be called Dr. Rambler. Um, you can call me Linda or Dr. Linda. Um, I'm the Community Education Director here at the Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities at on help. Um, that's our address, our mailing address. My office phone, my direct line is 679-1585. You can leave a message there. And we have our website, youconbeset.org. So are there any questions? Thank you, Linda. I, I do have a question uh, and two-part question. The first part, so how much is the school responsible for this transition process? And then also, if a family feels like they're not getting the services, the transition help from the school, if the child is eligible, let's say after age 18, and they don't feel like they're preparing them, how, how would they go about asking for help or, or what portals would they go through to make sure that that child is getting the in-school services that they should be getting? Okay, so great question. Essentially, Schools still own the IEP, and I go back to some of those definitions at the very beginning. Um, if your son or daughter or child has 
met all the academic requirements and nobody's determined that their epilepsy has in any way affected their academic learning or their other learning and their ability to function as an adult, they age out, there really are no other resources available for them unless they're eligible for assistance with vocational employment services. So schools own the IEP and we should begin to look at transition services basically from the moment of diagnosis, but officially, if your child has an IEP from the age of four to nine, so your child should be participating in that PPT process. They should be identifying their own strengths. They should be focusing on what they need to learn, what their future dreams are, with the obvious caveat that all of us think we want to do something at some point in our younger lives and many of us change that by the time we're an adult. But we want to be able to focus on what is in the best interest of your child. So I think if I can just scoop back to this resource here, the Connecticut Transition Service, there are in this um, website some very specific things that should be in transition plans. And after your child is aged out of the normal um, academic years and is in those transition years, and they have a transition plan as part of their IEP. And that's something families can advocate for. If they feel that their son or daughter is not having at the same advantages of a typical 18 or 19 year old, they can advocate for continuous services from the school to meet, for example, social behavioral objectives or to be um, better prepared for employment or independent living or access to community resources and those types of things. The Connecticut Transition Community of Practice has those Transition Bill of Rights in there. And there's also something that I find really handy, which is a set of transition skills that are called for transition skills that schools are supposed to be looking at and developing those transition plans around. The presumption is if you can do everything on that list independently, you are going to be a very comfortable, happy adult who can live an enviable life. However, for some people, they may need to be modified somewhat. So for example, somebody may not be able to verbally express that they have epilepsy. They may be able to hand somebody a card that says they have epilepsy. That should be in an IEP because part of the core transition goals is to be able to know your medical conditions to be able to access medical care. So I think families using that as guidepost for success, understanding what should be worked on, getting away from some of those Perhaps dreams if I can only get them to read more functional words and really moving toward what is the best way for my son or daughter to make that, to build a bridge from where they are in school to adult life, that, that's helpful. And those resources, like I said, the legal opportunities that are available, there's a whole procedure that you can go through due process wise. But I would start here first, that rather than going an adversarial route, because there's a lot of information here that the State Department of Education is really facilitating use of by our public schools right now. Um, one of the things, for example, that they're looking at is not having transition services base in a high school because it's not appropriate to have 21 year olds in the same building with 14 year olds. Um, that's too much of an age gap and it creates images and visions and difficulties in terms of managing programs and managing what's age appropriate. So those are things that families can be looking at um, and, and advocating for. And again, the, res the legal resources that I showed in this are things that they can look to if they're not getting their needs met. I think that answers both parts of your question. Yes, and just to add, Linda, so for each high school though, they should have like a staff person that works with those that are you know, kind of after that four year mark. Isn't that true that there's really a point person? I, I forget what they refer to them as, but a staff person that's working with these students that are um, like after 18 years of age. Is that true? Schools typically have somebody that's in a position of a transition coordinator. And they may have a whole cadre of people, depending on the size of the district, who continue to provide different types of instructional opportunities related to the transition plan. Okay. But there is almost always a transition coordinator, and I think that's the person that you're referring to. And if you can't figure out who that is in your school, 
you should call your central office and start with your director of special education or pupil personnel and ask who that is in the high school um, and begin working with that person as soon as possible. We are trying to get most, and I say we, the kind of universal we, collective we, um, through the Department of Developmental Services and through the State Department of Education um, and some other entities are trying to assist transition coordinators in using this more holistic, strength-based, vision-based approach um, through something called life course planning, but it's, it's a process to get that implemented across the board. So some families may already be getting introduced to this this coming school year, others may not. Um, but I think the transition coordinators are at least being exposed to this and the idea that um, we have to be looking at strengths, particularly in this year. We're not, we're not trying to remediate deficits anymore. We're trying to teach people the skills that they need to be as independent as possible and to have a quality of life. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I, I did like the part, Linda, where you talked about moving away from what is wrong and focusing more on um, the positive and being constructive with your planning. I, I feel like that's, that is always helpful for, for our clients is to be able to try and focus, and we know it isn't easy, on you know, more of th those positive things instead of all, all that might be wrong. And I think, again, if, you, if you're really thinking realistically, how do you take things that may not be going well and turn them into something that may need support? So, for example, somebody may need to take medication to keep epilepsy under control. Dr. Shram will deal with this more effectively, but what can we do to support that? That's not a negative thing. That doesn't make you less of a human being. That doesn't make you less worthy of having an enviable life, but it may mean you need additional supports in order to achieve those objectives. So, again, not looking at something that needs to be remediated, but something that is there, we're going to have to deal with, and let's move forward. Great. Thank you. Well, if we don't have, I don't see any questions. If we don't have any questions, just a reminder that this has been recorded and you can share this information with others that you may know who, who could benefit. Probably by the beginning of next week, it will be on our website. I believe also on your website too, Linda, you said? I, I just realized when I said it will be on after all of our webinars that the person who is doing this, I think, may be on vacation this week. So yes, I would look for it on our website next week as well. Okay. And our website, I, I know most people on here know, but it's uh, www.epilepsyct.com. And then your website again, Linda? Our website, if you don't mind me going down just a minute here, is www.uconucedd.org. Okay. And when you get the access to that, if you can please cut and plop this um, link for Survey Monkey, it's all confidential, but we do need to have this as a use set to report to the federal government what our activities are. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Linda. And if you can send me that Survey Monkey link, I can make sure that we get that out to people as well. I actually already sent it to Monica earlier today. Oh, did you? Okay. 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 Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. On behalf of um, the Epilepsy Foundation of Connecticut, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and taking the time to view this presentation. And we hope that you'll join us again next Friday at the same time at one o'clock for the next session in the series. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.